All right, well, good evening, everybody. We have a few more minutes to just go ahead and let everybody get in, but I want to start off by welcoming everybody to our monthly Date with History lecture series presented by the First Division Museum here at Cantini Park. Um, again, just remember if you want to change your subtitle settings, you can do so by using the live transcript button at the bottom to hide or to make your subtitles bigger or smaller. And we do suggest setting your screen to speaker view by using the button at the top right hand corner of your screen. It should say view. Um, but that being said, I have a few more little housekeeping things to talk about before we send it over to Dr. William, uh, Dr. William Meadows. Uh, first and foremost being this evening, we will be saving the last 15 minutes for question and answer, and you can submit questions to us by using the Q&A button at the bottom. We often have a great deal of questions, so I promise I will get to as many of them as humanly possible, but Dr. Will, uh, Meadows has graciously offered that if we don't get to any questions and they're still burning on your mind, just send them over to me in email and I'll send them over to him and we'll do our best to get those answered in a timely fashion. Um, also this evening, I want to welcome our Illinois State teachers who are joining us for their professional development credit. Welcome. We thank you so much. Uh, and last but certainly not least, I want to remind everybody that so far this year we've had really great luck with our Zoom presentations, but the internet does what the internet does sometimes. So if we have any technical difficulties during the presentations, please allow us a little bit of grace as we try and solve those and do the best we can. But that being said, I want to go ahead and tell you about some exciting programs that are coming up at the First Division Museum in June. As many of you know, the month of June is a very active month for the history of the First Division. Uh, first and foremost, we have Victory Week, which is the creation of the First Infantry Division. Their anniversary is next week. So to celebrate that, we're having another virtual presentation called A Conversation with the Generals. That's next week, Tuesday on June 8th at 7 p.m. here on Zoom. And that presentation is a panel of current and former commanding generals of the 1st Infantry Division, where they're gonna dig a little bit uh, deeper into the thoughts of leadership and things they've learned from their military service and their civilian lives and how we can apply that to our lives today. Uh, really quickly, I did wanna tell you about the six former commanding generals that are coming to that presentation. So allow me to use my notes real quick, make sure I get everything right. First and foremost, we have Major General Douglas Sims. The second, he is the current commanding general of the 1st Infantry Division. And he has soldiers deployed all around the globe, including Europe, the Middle East, and Korea. And most recently was sending 1st Division soldiers uh, in cities across the United States to help with COVID-19 vaccinations. We have General Vincent K. Brooks, who served with the 1st Division twice, first as a company commander and then later as the commanding general during deployments to Iraq um, during, as a part of pardon me, Task Force Victory in 2010. We have Lieutenant General uh, Ronald Watts. He commanded the 1st Infantry Division in the latter part of the Cold War and during his tenure led 1st Infantry Division soldiers and deterrent uh, missions forger. So that will be really interesting too. Uh, Lieutenant General Thomas Rame, who commanded the 1st Infantry Division during Operation Desert Storm during, in 1991. Uh, and during his combat operations, he led the 1st Division soldiers as they conducted the initial attack to penetrate Iraqi defensive positions. We also have Lieutenant General Perry Wiggins, who commanded the 1st Inf Infantry Division from 2008 to 2009 and is qualified to fly several aircraft in the Army's inventory. And during his time, he commanded the 1ID uh, throughout four provinces in Afghanistan. And then last but certainly not least, we have Major General uh, David Grange, who commanded the 1st Infantry Division as his last assignment before retiring in the year 2000 and he took command of the 1st Division in Bosnia. So we're really excited to host this amazing panel of former and current commanding generals to talk a little bit more about that. You can always sign up for that program online or you can send me an email and I'm happy to help you. But of course, next week is also the anniversary of D-Day, which is a big day for the 1st Infantry Division. So I wanna draw your attention to a program we're having not this Saturday, but next Saturday, Saturday, June 12th. And that's gonna be our uh, inaugural presentation of a new program called Veteran Voices, where we're gonna talk to former uh, members of the 1st Infantry Division, starting off with our very good friend, uh, Charles Norman Shea, whose very first day in combat ever was D-Day. He's also an Indigenous Native American veteran. He's a tribal elder of the Penobscot tribe. So I hope everybody joins in for that presentation next week. But I do want to mention one final thing. Oh, pardon me. We'll get to that at the end. At the end of our presentation, I hope you stick around because since we are uh, this evening talking about Native American uh, veterans, I want to highlight some upcoming programs at one of our French museums, which is the Trickster Gallery. So stay close to the end and we'll advertise some of those as well. 
That being said, I want to introduce our speaker this evening. So I hope everybody can join me in welcoming Dr. William Meadows. Uh, Dr. Meadows is the author of six books, five of which focus on Native American veterans. In 2004, he testified before a Congressional Senate hearing on the role of Native American co-talkers in the United States Armed Forces and spoke at the Library of Congress on Native American co-talkers in 2005. Dr. Meadows is the head of the Missouri State Native American Studies Committee, and he comes from a family of many Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine veterans. We want to thank your family for their service, but uh, let me be the one to give you a virtual round of applause of welcome on behalf of all of our guests. Dr. Meadows is going to go ahead and pull up his PowerPoint slides right now, so everybody give him just a second to get ready. Thank you so much, and Dr. Meadows, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I would like to thank the uh, First Division Museum and Laura Sears particularly for inviting me to give this presentation. I want to thank all of you for uh, zooming in tonight and everything. Um, I've been working with off and on with uh, the subject of Native American Code Talkers for about 30 years now. And uh, so what I'm going to work you through tonight is particularly that that involves World War I. So welcome to Native American Code Talkers of World War I. So I always give a brief dedication of this. This was the first code talker that I met and worked with. This was Forrest Kasnavoid, who was a Comanche code talker in World War II. Um, I was working in Oklahoma on a related project with Indian veterans when I met him and we got off the subject one day and I discovered he had been recruited uh, almost a year before Pearl Harbor to train with other Comanches to develop a language in World War II. Uh, working with him then led me to working with Choctaw, uh, where at that time everyone understood the origins of code talking came from, and we're going to add to that uh, story tonight. But without meeting Forrest and working with him, I may not have went down this uh, road, which has been one of the greatest roads of my life, and it's still going as I work with around 30 different uh, tribes across the country. So always my hat's off to uh, uh, Forrest Castnavoid here. So we're going to briefly be talking, uh, you know, just a little bit of background to position us here. World War I, of course, and the U.S. is getting involved in the latter, uh, latter part of it, 1917 and 18. Uh, most of us have briefly heard a little bit of, of background, but this is the typical type of warfare that is frequently in many of the zones involving trench warfare, of course, deplorable conditions in any, in any combat situation, uh, but with the, the trenches, the dugouts, uh, the Germans have much more sophisticated dugouts, and we're going to see that the some of the code talkers that we're dealing with are going to be in units that were taking those very types of positions. So these dugouts were these large underground, um, usually company size quarters, which were quite comfortable for the Germans, uh, much better than typically what the Americans had. Mass rushes, uh, the expression over the top, we've all heard about trying to cross no man's land and rush the opposing side's line and take it. And of course led to devastating uh, quantity of troops uh, being lost. No man's land, the area separating the two fortified lines. And of course, World War I was, much of it was a stalemated uh, line formation war until things really began to break out and change uh, in 1918. So a lot of stalemated lines, a lot of great casualties. Uh, this is the first war in which we have a lot of the newer technology. There's an old expression that most things we have today in the military or in war, a lot of them were uh, created during World War I. So the first use of poison gas, really widespread machine guns, flamethrowers, uh, tanks, airplanes, those types of things. And then of course the nature of the war. Again, it shifts from a stalemated trench style warfare uh, not in every zone, but in much of it, to more open movements in 1918. And this, of course, is going to be the, um, the culminating sector of the war where the code talkers really uh, appear and begin to be used. So just some brief uh, images here, um, some you know, in color now and then others still in black and white of some of the trench uh, conditions and things of that nature. And of course, we, you know, we've seen pictures of, of better quality trenches and much worse conditions as well. Uh, some of the scenes we've seen of, uh, again, uh, troops on both sides rushing across no man's land, trying to take positions, uh, <clears throat> the devastation of the artillery, of the gas attacks, et cetera. 
So where does the Native American component come into this story? Well, uh, it begins as early as Americans get involved in the conflict and everything. So when the draft starts in um, the spring of uh, 1917, uh, blacks are still segregated into all black units with white officers. Indians, on the other hand, are Native Americans, but many of the, many of the people I work with prefer the term Indian still today. Uh, many of these individuals uh, were in the um, National Guard units uh, before the war for the pay and the training, uh, as well as non-Indians, etc. The intention at this time, though, was not to segregate Indians, but to try to further assimilate them into mainstream American culture. So therefore, there are no official Native American units in World War I. However, we'll see there are conditions of certain states that had such high Native population that some companies and some regiments had very high numbers. But the official policy was integration at this time. The legal status of American Indians is very interesting at this time. Um, all tribes by 1917 had went through uh, many different types of land sessions, treaties being placed on reservations, and then many but not all had went through the process of allotment in the late 1800s. This is briefly where they um, surveyed and divided up the reservations, assigned or allowed individuals to choose individual parcels most commonly 160 acres, and then open the rest of the reservations to a land rush to uh, sell to non-Indian settlers around them. So if you went through allotment, you gained US citizenship. And there's, there's a lot of people that still don't realize that today. So when you came in on the reservation, you were technically a ward of the government. And so by 1917, about two thirds of natives had received US citizenship either through treaties or through the process of allotment. However, about one third of the population still uh, were technically non-citizens at this time. So in that case, non-citizens should not have been allowed to voluntarily enlist and been accepted in the US military. They also should not have been subject to the draft. Many cases of each happened. Uh, you had a high rate of voluntary enlistment, both for Native people and non-Native people in World War I. But there were Natives who were not citizens who volunteered and gladly did so. There were some who um, were, were uh, citizens and voluntary enlisted. And then there are also cases of individuals, both citizen and non-citizen, who were drafted and went. So it's a very mixed bag for uh, the question of citizenship. Many tribes are not clear even at this time whether they're citizens or not. Some citizen, uh, some individuals are not clear on the issue. So there are people that went through both ways. Why were natives serving in World War I? It's a very common question I get uh, in light of you know, negative past treatment and suffering a lot through uh, colonialism and, and the development of America as a country. Well, the first is there's a lot of groups that have tribal traditions. And so particularly some of the Plains cultures, for example, have very, very strong martial traditions where uh, being a warrior or being a veteran now in the modern day is a very, very high social status. It is part of the traditional gender roles for men, etc. So war, tradi tribal traditions and warrior status is a very important part of that. Many people saw these uh, events also as a defense of home and people. But now what we need to do is think of it in terms of two levels. Uh, many veterans, Native veterans explained to me that they went first and foremost to protect their remaining land base, even if it was small by this time, and their tribal uh, population. But then at the same time, they are also defending uh, the United States and non-Indian citizens in the United States. And many of the natives that were veterans by this time also uh, protecting as a US citizen. So there's kind of a dual level. Uh, it's almost like, um, uh, almost like dual citizenship in two countries in a sense, but a dual level of citizenship and service here that many people are not really aware of. Uh, some needed income, some, and this, some of these things apply also to non-natives as well, but uh, some people did it for an opportunity for income and steady uh, uh, income. Some did it to improve their civil and legal rights. There's Indians who were not citizens, 
who were still under very uh, suppressive Bureau of Indian Affairs regulations. And so a lot of people felt that if we served again, this might help us um, increase our position legally and, and in terms of civil rights. Uh, travel and adventure. Uh, to escape reservation conditions. Um, travel and adventure was a very important part of traditional native warrior culture where you, you set out on forays that sometimes involved very long distances and long times away from home. So that idea of, of long-term travel with military service was not unusual at all. Uh, and then the boarding schools. Boarding schools, as we'll see, preconditioned natives for military service. Uh, most of the uh, men that went through World War I uh, in the Native American communities, and again in World War II, the vast majority had been in either local uh, government Indian boarding schools or more regional ones. And so these were kind of pre-military. You wore uniforms, you marched to classes, you put up the flag, you had companies, you drilled. Uh, some even had um, like ROTC type units where you actually practiced um, with rifles and things of that nature. So they were very much a military style uh, schooling system. How and why did Native American code talking develop? Well, again, we're placed in towards the end of the war here, and it's really going to be the Muse Argonne campaign. And even in one case, we know of even a little bit before that at places like Chateau Thierry uh, in the summer of 1918, where this happened. So in all, uh, from what we're able to date from June of 1918 into November is the range we're looking at of 1918. So really the last half year of a war. Uh, American communications are being compromised. So there are several situations here that allow the enemy uh, to compromise our communications, particularly those by radio or those by telephone. Phones between companies are easily tapped into. Anywhere between point A and point B that you can clip onto that wire, it's just like a party line on an old telephone system and you can listen in uh, you know, fully. Uh, there are distance listening devices. There's a coil-like, um, metallic coil-like device that the Germans use. It can be placed anywhere from two to about four, four and a half kilometers behind your own lines. And you can uh, pick up the magnetic pull or the currency of a uh, wired or telephone communication and draw that in by magnetic pool and overhear it and listen to it. Uh, we had some devices that were somewhat similar to that. Uh, buzzer phone and codes. So the US has a, a device called a buzzer phone, which uh, you can implement in code in a message. It uses a series of lights and buzzes, uh, but it's very slow to use it. It takes time to, to code the message, to send it, uh, to record it, and then hand it off. And so what is needed here uh, is something that is very fast and, and secure. Runners, you can physically write a message and carry it to a runner in a company, say from company A to company B. Uh, but the minute that individual appears above the, the trenches or the lines and particularly running, he is a easy target for snipers, uh, for machine gun fire. Um, they know he's carrying a message from, from point A to B, so they are trying to knock him out. One in four are being shot or captured, so the messages are not coming through. So the need is for secure, but also immediate communications, something that, that needs to be faster than the coding and decoding methods that the US, uh, or the AEF, I should say, at this time has. Uh, these are just some scenes of communicators. These are non-Indian units here. Uh, in different signal battalions and groups, uh, laying wires between units, uh, checking telephones, checking switchboards, et cetera. And you'll notice in the uh, upper right there, there's an officer, US officer checking a phone. Uh, in the Meuse Argonne campaign, and even a little bit before that, particularly Germany was retreating so fast in this section of France that they were sometimes leaving intact communication lines completely um, completely functioning and abandoned. And the US officers suspected they were hoping that they would simply pick those up and use those rather than install their own and it would be easier to, um, to eavesdrop or, or take the communications. 
Now, in the Muse Argonne campaign, just on a big scale here, we're looking at several lines heading towards the city of Sedan. And Sedan was a, a major goal uh, towards the end of the war because it was a major railway hub, hub line, um, both for troops, supplies, food, et cetera. If Sedan, if the heights over Sedan can be taken and controlled with machine gun and artillery, it will sever the supply line for the German army. And so you will have some troops to the northwest of that, some to the southeast, but it will base, basically cut their forces in half. So a lot of the famous fights, uh, St. Mihiel, Chateau Thierry, Verdun, et cetera, a lot of these are aiming towards the key city uh, of Sedan. And again, this is only part of the front. You can see the front is going all the way up close to uh, Ghent and, and Calais there. Um, the four tribes that we have the most information on and three of them or four that we have specific dates for, uh, I have maps here and also their tribal flags, but it's the Ho-Chunk um, who are better, better known popularly as the Winnebago from uh, Wisconsin, uh, the Eastern Band Cherokee from North Carolina, um, and then Choctaw and Oklahoma Cherokee from Oklahoma. And so this is just showing you some of the communities where these um, groups are for. These are going to be four of the seven groups that we know of in World War I that are used as code talkers. So first, the Ho-Chunk, um, 7th Infantry Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division. We know they are used at some point before June 21st of 1918. How do we know this? The gentlemen that were doing it were wounded and evacuated that day. Uh, but they wrote about in detail what they did and everything. One letter to the individual's father, and part of it was published in the Carlisle Indian School uh, newsletter. And so here is a, re uh, a revision of the letter. The original letter was to his father, but a synopsis of that letter, um, Winnebago Indian upheld record of ancestors in World War. And it's talking about um, Robert Big Thunder and Jonathan Longtail from the Wisconsin um, Ho-Chunk. And then this is Robert Big Thunder's Indian card at the National Archives. There were special collections and records kept on Indian soldiers as part of a, just, just barely after the war ended, a post-war study of Native Americans in military service. And you can see where it says that uh, he went over the line three times, also adopted the Indian code signal. So this is talking about him using his language uh, for communications. And then it, it further uh, tells us, now we don't know how much earlier they were using this yet, but we know they were using it uh, by that point. The Eastern Band Cherokee, uh, 119th, 120th regiments in the 30th division. A lot of this is the first and second North Carolina uh, National Guard that is pulled into this uh, formation. Later at uh, St. Quentin and Cambrai uh, in October 7th and 8th plus, because it continued to be used after that, but we, the uh, letter from an officer, it's not clear what day he's speaking of, but it's the 7th and or the 8th when it starts. And so this is from an officer. This is a map of where they were. Uh, it was kind of stalled out. It was stalemated for a while, and you can see the uh, 120th right there, kind of in the middle. Uh, the problem they were having was the same thing. Uh, anything they tried to send, the Germans would pick up. They would counter it before it could uh, become effective. And so one day there was an officer in the uh, 30th here speaking to another officer. And he, he later he recorded the conversation later. He said, literally asked, how is it over there with you? And he said, oh, I'm fine. He said, you know, the Germans have been shelling us all morning. But he said, you know, they're 100 yards behind our, our rear troops. They're missing us everything. We're, we haven't been scratched. And within just a very, very few minutes, shells were coming down right on top of him. So that's where they realized they're listening to every word that we say. So an officer uh, that had been in the unit for quite some time, the officers of the signal battalion were pulled together and said, how do we solve this scenario? And so that officer, Captain John Stanley, um, informed the uh, division signal officer that there were several, a lot of, actually a lot of Cherokee Indians in the 119th and 120, and they had been in the um, 
uh, National Guard and were now in the uh, division and could be put on the phones and everything. So the next day, every command post from brigade forward included, uh, including some company command posts, had a telephone with a Cherokee Indian beside it. Uh, no further messages were intercepted by the enemy uh, that were heard of. And three days later, a German officer that was captured uh, because the uh, 30th began to make great ground, he inquired about the uh, unknown languages that he heard. And he said something to the effect of, we have uh, linguists that know practically every major language in the world. We've never heard anything like this. What was it? And um, they uh, basically said it was just American. And of course, no one would tell uh, what the exact use of it was. But it was used uh, by this officer, and he wrote up a full report of it later in, uh, in uh, officer training and everything. Uh, Choctaw and Oklahoma Cherokee in the 36th Division, 142nd Infantry Regiment. Uh, the dates here, October 26th, 27th, uh, spills over a little bit into the 28th of 1918. So this is a couple, uh, one is a recruiting photo. Indian boarding schools were heavily uh, targeted. They were an area that had high quantities of young male men, right? Schools were. Um, and so this is actually, there, there's quite a few um, natives that went from uh, Bochito um, or uh, Armstrong Academy at Bochito, Oklahoma. There is a story uh, that the entire baseball team, and there are several accounts of it, so it seems fairly reliable. Uh, the entire baseball team, when a recruiter came to the school, requested of the superintendent to be allowed to enlist, and he gave their blessing. And so it's believed that this photograph may represent the entire baseball team uh, of the Indian Academy at that time. Uh, now, you will see this photo sometimes misidentified. It says that these are the original Choctaw code talkers. Uh, they are not. There may have been somebody in the photo that ended up as a code talker, but the idea to form code talkers was still more than a year away. Uh, so there's no way that this could actually be uh, the code talkers themselves. This is the company that these men, most of these men ended up in, which is Company E of the 142nd. Um, it was an all Indian company at one time with the exception of a handful of white officers and one white uh, enlisted man. Uh, later, it would transfer out about 50 men to the 42nd Division as replacements, but it still maintained uh, usually 60 to 70 percent or more of non-Indian membership throughout the whole war. Uh, there were 14 languages. Some groups had as many as close to 88 or 89 uh, members of a tribe. One group had around 60 some, and then smaller and smaller numbers of other tribes. This is the five of the original eight code talkers uh, that the Choctaw used uh, in World War I. And this is their officer, Captain uh, E.W. Horner, who was from Mena, Arkansas. I had the good fortune through a native friend, found out that he had a daughter who is still with us to this day. Uh, she's in her 90s now. And so I made contact with her and went down and did an interview with her. And she had several papers of her father's regarding the code talkers and how they were used and things that have never been deposited or used or seen the light of day. And so this really answered a lot of uh, definitively a lot of points and questions that were alluded to sometimes, uh, but not clearly stated. So this is the, where they're at. They're coming through uh, uh, M Mount Blanc, this uh, portion of the fighting and everything, uh, St. Etienne, uh, Arns, they, and please excuse my French, I, I'm not good at French. Uh, they are heading towards a point called Forest Farm that you'll see with the upper blue arrow there. It's a peninsula along the Ain River. And so the Germans by this point had been pushed back uh, from St. Antienne all the way across the Ain, with the exception of Forest Farm Peninsula. And this is near a, uh, a very, very small town named uh, uh, Raleigh Aoi. Um, the significance of this peninsula is that it was a much elevated uh, parcel of land, therefore uh, tactically greatly advantageous. They, could, they were meters above everybody else, could see anything approaching, they could cover their flanks, Nobody was going to cross this river in this sector without taking that point out first. The French tried three times to take the position and were repelled by the Germans. The 36th was brought in to relieve them and they were given the task. And so what they did 
was uh, they knew that the Germans were listening to their communications. So Colonel Bloor um, decided to, of the 142nd, tried, decided to try a tactic. He said, let's get some of these um, Native Americans. So there was a call down from the uh, division intelligence officer to, uh, at this time, Captain Horner, uh, who was company E with all the natives in the company and basically said, can you get me eight of these gentlemen who speak very good English and are you know, excellent in their own language and you know, very, very acute. So he picked eight guys. They put one at each company along portions of this line. Uh, they did what they decided to do was to make a false movement to test the Germans. On the night of the 26th, they had two companies of men moved from one small point to the next to see if the Germans would react. They're counting on the Germans overhearing it and listening, but they're betting that they'll never know what language it is or be able to understand it. It works, uh, no response from the Germans, works perfect. The next day they sent forward scouts out, crawled very close to the German positions, but remained concealed. They sent communications in Choctaw out uh, throughout all the companies to prepare for an attack and then had these advanced scouts to monitor for movements and positions, nothing changed. So what they did on the, uh, on the 27th at around four o'clock in the evening, they started a 20 minute walking artillery barrage and the horizontal lines across the peninsula, that is the artillery bar barrage in three minute increments. So they're creeping that barrage forward there. Uh, they had the troops from all these different companies in the 141st, 142nd, um, follow very closely behind the artillery, just, just a very short distance behind it. So when the artillery shut off, having forced the Germans down into their dugouts, into their trenches, et cetera, for cover, the U.S. troops of the 36th now could rush the position in a matter of seconds and took it very, very quite easily. Uh, the Americans only lost 14 soldiers in the attack. Uh, the Germans lost around 200, another 300 captured. And so they, with this, uh, taking this very strategic point then, uh, the army is able to, the AEF is, is able to continue across the Ain and begin to push the Germans further. So this was a very, very uh, important use of Choctaw. It's uh, worked without a flaw. They knew that they heard it, but were not able to do it. Now, this is a letter that Captain Bloor, and this is him here who directed it, uh, wrote a letter in January of 1919. Um, basically, two days after the attack was over, the 36th was put into a relief area and moved back uh, to the south. It took them about three days to get to the relief area. Once they got there, um, a Cheyenne officer, a Cheyenne lieutenant named Ben Cloud, was given orders to take 18 um, non-commissioned, or I'm sorry, 18 enlisted men, three non-commissioned officers, and train them better on how to send messages on telephones, give them more practice, all native. And they realized that there were some things that was difficult to convey that they simply didn't have native words for. And to, so to form placebos for them, to form code words for them. And this is exactly what they did. This is the original document. This is blown up a little bit so you can see it. So they created a sample of these terms here. It didn't really matter what you called them, just something that the group agreed for. So rations, they simply used the word for food. Gas, they used the term bad air. Casualties were called scalps. Uh, a patrol was called mini scouts, so forth and so on. Ammunition, arrows. Uh, didn't have to be complex, just something that was shared by them. Grenades were called stones, etc. Now, they had a, they had a five-day training session, a week of training doing this. Uh, the very next, they finished it on the 10th. The very next day, the war, the armistice was signed on the 11th. They never got to go back into combat and use the code terms. But the importance of what they did is that they were using their language like like the other groups were, but they developed the idea of we'll take an unknown language and now we'll make a, a vocabulary list that only we know. People back home could literally translate what we're saying, but they don't know how we're applying it to the subject and then insert that into the language. So a code within an unknown language, a type of double code.
Uh, these are some of the gentlemen. We do not have a definitive list. The Army never kept a list of who uh, the original eight were or who the total of, of 21 men later on were. Uh, through families, though, we've been able to come up with just about exactly the right number. Uh, we don't know who the non-commissioned officers were, uh, but the 18 or so uh, Choctaws, we pretty well know exactly who they were. But these are some of the, uh, some of the men here. Some were in the first group, some were in the training group towards the end of the war. Uh, this is Tobias Frazier. He was wounded, received a Purple Heart. One of the gentlemen here. Um, shout out to the Big Red One here. So Otis Leader was not in this other group of Choctaw, but he was a Choctaw who ended up in the First Division. Leader has a very interesting story. Uh, he was a foreman on a cattle ranch in Southeast Oklahoma around Pittsburgh County. Um, his two, the ranch owners were two Swiss Americans. And so he went with them to Fort uh, Worth to sell some cattle and to buy new stock and bring back, have shipped back. While he was there, they're walking around the stockyards inspecting uh, animals. Uh, the two owners are speaking uh, with a very German accented English. And then they also spoke German as well. Uh, leader uh, is noticed by a either either an FBI or a federal marshal, and they begin to follow these men around. And one of them actually noticed at a point that somebody was kind of following them, but they didn't know why. They suspected that leader, they thought he was a Spaniard from Spain, and they thought the other two were Germans and that they were spies. So the agents uh, radio, or I'm sorry, radio telegraphed back to their hometown. When they got on the train, they saw where they were going. And they had the local marshal waiting at the train station to arrest them when they got off the train. When they stepped off the train, um, all four men had known each other for many, many years. And the marshal had a good laugh because he realized these are not spies. These are local people I've grown up with, you know. Um, so it enraged Leader so much, he was so mad that he was suspected of being a spy, that just a very short time later, he went and uh, signed up to enlist, and then I think he had like 10 or 10 weeks or uh, two weeks or 10 days to get his affairs in order, and then he went into the service early in 1917, and so he served in the Big Red One. Uh, he was highly decorated, um, many, many awards. Uh, but later, his third third uh, gas attack put him in the hospital uh, in October. But there is a newspaper clipping of an interview with him where he says he was pulled out of the hospital and put on telephones to talk with other Choctaw to send messages. So at some point, they were using him for the same basic purpose. We don't know if, if other people were in the first were talking with him or if it was other units. We simply do not know. Uh, George Adair is a Cherokee. And he was in the same group uh, at uh, Forest Farm. There was a number of Cherokees that were used. And this is the document um, he's identified in a photo in 1926 as having used his language. And then here's the official um, US Army document uh, describing the use of both tribes in that division. Uh, there are Comanche in the 90th division that are used as well. And so these are five gentlemen um, that were in the 357th Infantry Regiment, 90th Division. Um, we do not know exact date when they started. Uh, we, we can narrow down to which campaigns they were in and get a scope of time, but it seems most likely it was probably Meuse Argonne at this time. Uh, we do have a few accounts. I interviewed the son of one of these individuals who knew uh, what his father had told him and who ended up being a, a World War II code talker. <clears throat> this is Calvin Achevit. He was um, given the Belgian War Cross and everything. So um, Belgian government had given him a War Cross for talking over the lines when they were trapped by the enemy. His Comanche tongue helped him get messages across that were not understood by the enemy. So in his case, it seems like it was an impromptu uh, situation that led to them being used. Uh, one of the sons of one of the other code talkers said that he and another Comanche were sighting in artillery on an artillery piece when an officer heard them talking to each other in Comanche, and that's how they got pulled into the group. So a lot of this was, was just happenstance. It, none of it was planned before the war. So the formation. 
There's no overarching plan with Native American code talkers in World War I. Independent formation in local units. It's just a, a situation come up. They, what do we have? What resources, what tactics do we have that we could muster to solve this situation? Why does code talking work? Well, the first is it's, these are little known obscure languages outside of their home communities. They're not known to scholars. They're not known in other countries, etc. They are largely unwritten. Uh, now, Choctaw and Cherokee have been written since the 1820s, but it has primarily been uh, simply Bibles, uh, hymnals, and with the Cherokee tribal newspapers, things of that nature. So again, these are not sources that would circulate beyond the community. Therefore, the Germans you know, would not have them. European libraries would not have them. Uh, but also, they didn't have time. They did not have time uh, this late in the war and with the speed of the AEF movement uh, to actually put much time into breaking these. So it was there. It was more reactionary than uh, time to crack any kind of code. The languages are not based on mathematical codes. So it's not like a cipher or a replacement where today the letter one represents the letter F and the letter two represents the letter W, something of that nature. It's, they're not based on European languages or syntax. So your subject verb object agreement sometimes are different uh, prefixes, suffixes. So you simply do not have the same patterns to begin to pick up on uh, to compare with the known European languages. And then coded vocabulary placed within the languages. Again, it was developed late in the war, but it'll be used much more extensively in World War II. That's really the signature hallmark is the two things together. Uh, advantages of Native American code talking. Well, speed is obviously the first one. As quick as I'm talking to you, you could turn around and translate this into another language to somebody and they could hand those orders off immediately. So no coding uh, like with a machine or decoding that downtime. They're very secure. They were never broken. There's multiple cases of German officers inquiring about them. No one had a clue what was being spoken, whether it was Indian or not, anything of that nature. And again, cases of Germans inquiring. Uh, there's no indication that tribes were ordered to keep the code project secret. Now that's a very common popular myth. Um, when you hear the word code, you assume tight security, high secrecy. But this was all de facto stuff, just spontaneous local organization, nothing higher than the local units. And there were simply, as we'll see, no orders uh, to keep it uh, secret or that you couldn't talk about, et cetera. It, it was a method to solve a problem at the time and it was done with. There really wasn't any idea or thought by the time the war ended that we should secure this. So hence, newspaper articles just explode. Uh, Captain Bloor writes a memo that's actually published in the French newspaper uh, in February of 19 before the troops come home. Others are appearing in March, in May, uh, early June, April, before the troops even come back. And so these are specifying, you can see Indian tongue used as code to dodge spies. Uh, Choctaw tongue gave surprise to the Germans. And these are, these are from a reprint of Colonel Bloor's memo, and the other is the signal battalion commander, Major George Robinson. Even the two-star general, the uh, head of staff of the 36th Division, publicly talks about the code talkers. There is no uh, secrecy whatsoever. Here's other articles with some of the individual's photos and talking about them. Another article talking about the use of Lakota or Sioux uh, Indians. It does not specify which group or the individuals, but there are several. And this is in the Stars and Stripes newspaper, the official A, you know, uh, Army newspaper. So again, no, no concern for any uh, secrecy or confidentiality at this time. Now, the irony of all this, the whole story is that 
again, the boarding school situation. This is Carlisle Indian School, one of the distant schools. Most of the code talkers uh, went to local boarding schools uh, that we found out as opposed to the far distant ones. But these were schools, again, that were primarily pro-assimilation and you could not use your languages at them most of the time. Some were a little more lenient than others, but most of them did not allow any native culture, language use, anything. So these gentlemen were resilient enough to hang on to their language, even though going through this you know, arduous educational experience. And then the way I always look at it, they are gracious enough to share that language when asked to do so to help the, uh, the army, the AEF. Types of Native American code talking. So briefly, I saw a distinction in types early on in my research. Type one is using languages with specially devised code. So the Choctaw started this in World War I. They're the only group that we know of, there may have been others, but the only one we know of that actually formed vocabulary. But in World War II, it became much more common. And then type two is just using the languages without specially devised code. So there are really two types of code talking going on. Both are effective. And to me, what's important here is that they're both referred to by both the military and the public press uh, as codes. So even though they're a little different than what we think of as codes, they're considered codes by the military and then hence by the public. This is just a brief chart showing the groups. Again, seven different tribes in eight different units at least that we know of. I suspect there are others, of course, but it this was something done in the field. There's very little documentation on it. So it's, it's really hard to find the information. You go through a long time, and then once in a while you get lucky and you find some records. Um, although the Choctaw are long thought to have been the first to use their language as a code, and I, I believe this myself for probably two and a half decades, just like the Choctaws and everybody else, uh, we now have some definitive dates for enough groups. So the Ho-Chunk we know used it first, the Eastern Band Cherokee second, and then the Choctaw and Oklahoma Cherokee third. Now, this could literally change tomorrow should a, do, a, new, a new folder pop up and has a document with a date in it for another group. So this is just as we know of at present. Uh, Post-World War I, there are some French decorations for the Choctaws. They are mentioned widely in newspapers. I have over 40 some sources from around 1919 and a little bit after. Uh, marking, you know, talking about these, these code talkers, military publications, public newspapers, uh, speeches by military officers, many, many accounts and everything. Uh, there's no official U.S. government recognition, and that's, that's something that's frequently mentioned now, but there, in reality, there probably wasn't going to be then anyway. This was something that a few men, you know, were asked to do. They did it, it worked, and they moved on. Uh, everybody was happy to come home from the ward. They were never looking for awards themselves, even later in, in their own life. They never asked for any kind of recognition or something. It's just something they were asked to do and they did it because they could contribute. Uh, so no recognition at the time. The army remains aware of, of using the code talkers. There is a study done after the war that records all the different ways of contributions of natives and different reports. And that's why Colonel Bloor and Morris and some of the others, that's the only reason they wrote these accounts. They were asked to, to do it as part of a military study. So without that study, we probably would have very, very, very little documentation of them. And again, what's important is they're going to set the precedent for other groups in World War II. Now, following this, how have they been recognized? And so this is really going to move up to about the 1980s uh, when you start to have some grassroots movements that involve recognition for them. So the first is going to be tribes. Uh, the Hopi out in Arizona actually recognized their code talkers, their World War II code talkers around 1982. Uh, in 1986, the Choctaw uh, put up a, a very nice monument for their uh, war memorial. And then it has, uh, you know, dedicated to the original Choctaw code talkers and everything. They produced a medal for the families. At that time, all their World War I code talkers were deceased, but they produced a very nice, uh, it's called the Choctaw Medal of Valor uh, for the families. 
And what this event did, it really, it got notice and it really kickstarted a lot of other tribes to say, hey, you know, we had some of those guys too that were also code talkers. And it started this very dispersed multi-state uh, small grassroots movement. In 1989, the French government and the Choctaw, or I'm sorry, the French government and the state of Oklahoma uh, came together at the Oklahoma State Capitol and recognized the Choctaw and Comanche code talkers of both world wars. Uh, there were also a few, there were four Choctaw code talkers in World War II, and there were 17 Comanches in World War II. And so this was the last surviving World War II Choctaw code talker, uh, Schlitt Billy, very highly decorated man. And so this, again, gained uh, more notice, uh, more press, and, and continued the ball moving. In 2002, I began working with these gentlemen around um, probably about 1992 two or one, somewhere in that era. A little bit of stuff even as early as 89. But in 2002, uh, I published uh, Comanche Code Talkers of World War II. The focus of the book is on the Comanches, but chapter one is primarily, it's on World War I and it's primarily about the Choctaw. So this put me in touch with the Choctaw um, and I did this book here. I did it, you know, a lot of it because it, it hadn't been recorded. There was nothing on, on either group, but I didn't necessarily know that I was going to go beyond this project. And so this book came out and then one day the phone rang and I got a call from um, Office of Senator Tom Daschle and asked me, would you please come up? We want to know everything about every Native American group you know something about that had code talkers, both world wars, um, come up and, um, and speak. So I went up, this is the uh, Choctaw Nation Chief Greg Pyle, uh, Melvin Kirchie Jr., the Comanche uh, Vice Chief over here. So I always joke and tell people I had 15 minutes of C-SPAN and Missouri State loved it because our logo was on the TV the whole time. So I've already used up my 15 minutes of fame. I'm, I'm a nobody now, uh, but it was a great time. We all had 15 minutes. We presented our material. What came out of this was, was just pure excitement. Um, and what happened was legislation started rolling. We, we got a bill started uh, with the help particularly of the Oklahoma representatives and senators and got it started. It took four years uh, to get this uh, passed. But in 2008, the Code Talkers Recognition Act uh, was passed. Now, what was significant about this, the Navajo had already been awarded uh, the uh, Congressional Gold and Silver Medals in 2001 is when they received them, and 2000 was the bill. Uh, but the Navajos, of course, were one of the very last groups formed. They were the largest, almost 420 men, and their accomplishments, they probably did more than any other group has. But uh, none of the other groups, and at this time we're talking over 30 groups, had been recognized. So this act brought equal representation for all groups uh, that had not received it, all non-Navajo groups, for both world wars. And it's an open event. So there are still three new tribes that, I'm, that I have documentation on that I'm trying to get the recognition and uh, get them, get them their, their just due. Uh, the Choctaws began, they made like their own documentary film. And so a lot of the tribes are getting involved in ways of recognizing. Um, there has been a whole series of uh, bridges, um, highways, sections of highways named after code talkers, statues in part designed based on code talkers, uh, things of that nature uh, in several communities. The Navajo have them, the Hopi, uh, the Choctaw, the Comanche in Oklahoma. So there's a lot of, lot of good press and good uh, things that are coming out of this. This is uh, Greg Pyle, the Choctaw chief at the time, and Judy Allen, who I've worked, for, worked with for a very long time um, on some of the research here on their code talkers. Uh, Nuchi Neshoba is the president of the Choctaw Code Talker Association, which I'm a, um, I think I'm an associate member of. I'm not a descendant of one of the Choctaw Code Talkers, but I'm a member of the organization. And they are very active in um, uh, teaching about the group, public schools, information, particularly in the Oklahoma uh, kind of Texas community and everything. But uh, I work with them a lot in my, in my uh, book that deals with this section here and everything. Uh, this is the Comanches putting up their Comanche uh, 
Food Talker Trailway sign, their statue with their World War I veterans and some of their World War II, and then it continues on the other side. Museum displays, um, a hall at Fort Sill Army Base at Lawton, Oklahoma. So again, there's a lot of, a lot of long overdue uh, representation and honor being given to these men. Uh, World War I uh, Museum in Kansas City, the National World War I Museum has a small display on, on uh, code talkers and I'm gently encouraging them to expand it. Um, after the act passed five years later, the government originally said, we're gonna design one medal and present it to all the 30 some tribes that have code talkers. And the tribe said, no, you're not. <laughs> And so the tribe said, if it's going to represent our tribe, it's going to represent us. It's going to have something from us, our symbols, what's important to us, things that dealt with these individual men, etc. So the tribes got involved with the treasury and the tribes submitted designs and everything and voted and got one. And then the engravers at the mint at the treasury uh, engraved them, finally got it, you know, got the engraving approved by the tribe and then the medals were um, were set. And so I went back up to cover the gold medal ceremony. This is in Emancipation Hall at the Capitol. So 33 tribes received uh, gold medals. That day, 25 received them. The other eight were still being in the process of design. They were recognized there, but they would receive the medals later. So each tribe got one gold medal, usually in their tribal museum or cultural center. Uh, each surviving code talker or their family. Uh, received a silver medal. And then there are bronze online that are uh, for sale to anyone, the public and, and anybody that wants them. And so here's what some of the medals look like, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, and then the Comanche medals. Uh, there's a design of what the sketches would look like before they're engraved and everything. And you'll notice a lot of them have uh, words written in their own languages. There's Cherokee written on the one in the middle. There's Comanche over here. Uh, on the back of them, they have usually like the division crest that they were in. They have clan symbols of the members. A lot of very, very uh, culturally specific, tribally specific information. The Choctaws with Senator Dan Boren receiving their medals. That day, this is the gold medal for the Choctaw Nation. Uh, these are three individuals that worked with me on, on aspects of this for many, many years, and I always want to recognize them. Robin Roberts is Meskwaki from Iowa, Andrea Page is Unkpapa Lakota uh, from North Dakota, and uh, Don Loudner there is from South Dakota. He is the uh, president of the National Native American Veterans Association, so one of the few times we're all able to be in person together. Just this January, <clears throat> my book, The First uh, Code Talkers came out and it focused specifically on World War I. So if you wanna know more, more of the anecdotes, the details, some of the humor stories, the background, there's a lot more in that, uh, again, if you're interested. Uh, the legacy, what is the legacy of the Code Talkers? Well, again, in World War I, it set the precedent that was expanded and used in World War II. There were over 30 groups used in World War II. And at least I think five or six of them had specially designed vocabulary lists inserted into the language. So there was a lot of type one, but there's also even many more type two code talkers. Uh, this is a, a tremendous source of pride for both the families involved and the tribes involved. It is one of the just bright spots of the last couple decades that really, um, you know, is affecting their history, their presentation, what people know about them, etc. It's a reminder of the importance of different languages and cultures. We, you know, today we promote multiculturalism, lots of languages, etc. At this period, they were trying to suppress them. So it's a valuable lesson in you should never stamp out a language. You never know when it might help you, might uh, help save you or come to your uh, advantage. Many tribal languages today are declining, but there are revitalization programs continuing. So I work with tribes that have as few as 25 speakers to some that have several thousand speakers. Um, so they're trying very much to hang on to their languages and uh, continue those. And then it is a very unique source of native and US armed forces history, both 
just for people interested in military history, but also those that are interested in, in native history and then where those uh, overlap. Uh, I've included a, a biography on here of some of my works and things to do with the Code Talker Act that you can reference later when it's posted. And with that, I will just simply say there is still more research that I'm doing and still more to be done. And I thank you for your time and I'm uh, more than happy to answer any Q&A for you. Thank you so much. All right, since we are gathered virtually, I will give you the round of applause. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us this evening. It was so interesting. And I don't wanna waste any time uh, because there are so many great questions. I promised you our guests are really good question askers and they have some good ones this evening. So I wanna make sure I get to as many of these as possible. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, a lot of guests are very interested in co-talking in World War II. We, we, hear, we hear about that a lot or often. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about how code talking in World War One, um, pardon me, in World War II differs than in World War I? Um, it differs in World War II in the number of groups used and that example there are, let me count on here a minute, there are four groups specifically, three groups specific, no I'm sorry, four specifically recruited about a year before Pearl Harbor to form code talking units with vocabulary. So very much taking the Choctaw model and increasing it. And those are Chippewas, they're Oneidas, they are Meskwakis from Iowa, and they are Comanches from Oklahoma. The Navajo later uh, would be the biggest group that went through the, in the Marine Corps with that type of thing. There's also a group of Hopis that were brought together and created code words and everything. So there's six groups that used specially coded vocabulary now, there are, uh, again, close to 25 or 24 other groups that they simply, wherever they found natives, they pulled them together and put them on the radio. And there, there are some really funny anecdotal stories about how they discovered they had two people that spoke the same language. But we're talking close to 30 different groups, and it's as small as two-man teams to sometimes seven, sometimes three, sometimes 17 uh, and then the Navajos with a much larger program, you know. While we're on the topic of World War II, um, and hopefully, I, I'm so glad to read that so many of you are interested in this topic. Um, hopefully, we can have Dr. Meadows out again in the future. We can learn more about World War II code talking. Um, but while we're on the topic, was code talking used post World War II? That's a great question. There, there's a lot of hints about it. There's a lot of like assertions about it. Um, but I do not think so, and here and here's why. Now you'll you'll find there's a couple things on the media that that says it was. Um, I, I interviewed several of the Navajo code talkers before they passed. Uh, several of them went right back in for Korea, which a lot of World War II veterans they went right back into Korea. None of the code talkers were ever used for code talking, and they said they made there was no effort to ever pull us back together to use us any any way like that. There's also <clears throat> Uh, Don Loudner and I were looking at some research. He was he was a very high level code encryptor and breaker in World War in in Korea. I'm sorry. Um, there is a a machine came out called an ASAM seven that basically allowed us to start encrypting stuff uh, so we could speak freely over the air and it's much much harder to break it or intercept it th those kind of things. So. Uh, while there's some hints, I can find no evidence through the military or the code talkers themselves that it was ever used past World War II. Interesting. Now, you know, there could be there could be an individual officer that took two two Navajos and just used them on the phone or something, but maybe not officially as code talkers. Right. Um while we're again, while we're on this topic, and thank you so much, we're not gonna stay in World War II all evening long, but this is an interesting question was um at the end of World War, at, pardon me. At the end of World War One, brought so much publicity as we saw for this, and they were so successful in World War Two. Did Germany ever try to like learn this language? Like as they were learning and they were hearing and coming over, so did they ever try to learn it? Good question. I, I want these these people in my next class uh, that I teach because these are good. <laughs> You're all A plus students. I told you they were. Yeah, this is great. That's a great question. Now again. There are stories you will hear, and there were German anthropologists that worked in the U.S. after World War I, just like we had people over there in Japan and everywhere else. Um, 
there are, you'll hear rumors and you'll hear stories about things, but again, I have never found, um, and I've even talked to a couple of people that, that know a lot about German anthropologists, I've never found any solid documentation that it actually happened. Um, I don't think it's far-fetched at all. I think it's quite possible, uh, but I don't, I don't know of anything really concrete, you know, that I can say, here's some evidence beyond just rumors, you know. But it's it's very quite possible. But in the in the event it happened, it didn't work. <laughs> so it you know we still used them and they work fine. So excellent. So on uh, one of the maps you showed us, the 30th Infantry Division operational map showed that it was serving adjacent to Australian units. Um, we know about Native Americans and American Indians during during this time period, uh, but what about other countries? Uh, were, was, for example, Australian using indigenous persons from in Australia in combat roles similar to how the United States was? Uh, that's a tough one because I, I'm really not that good on, on the other, other countries and things like that. Now, I know that you know, there's a lot of troops from India there's a lot of in the British Army and things like that. It's quite possible that they use some different dialect because India India has a ton of languages, you know, things like that. Um, I know that, um, you know, I think it was I think it was England used Latin during the Boer War in Africa to so that the other side couldn't, you know, they didn't speak Latin, they wouldn't know what they're talking about. I know that was the case of other languages being used. Um, it's quite possible. You know, I always, in World War II, I always said the Japanese should have used Ainu against us, but Ainu were looked down upon racially as complete inferiors as indigenous people, and they were not respected. So there, you know, that could have been one used against us. But that's, that's a great question, but I just simply do not know those other militaries. It's, it's outside of my area. Definitely something to learn more about for sure. sure. Absolutely. Um, oh, this is a very interesting question. I love. I can't wait to hear what you what your thoughts are um, today, in twenty twenty one. Do you think that code talking would work in a situation against adversaries if we were to uh, try and use this today? Would it work? It's it's possible, but a lot of the languages now are written. Um, things are on the internet, dictionaries, and things like that. You know, it's possible it could work in a very short term situation because it would take you a while to figure out what it is and then get those resources. But in the long term, any any language can be broken given enough time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what you always look for is there's only a certain amount of most human languages use about 30 sounds. So 30 letters or less, you know, of all the things that we can do. Um, so you're looking at a limited number of vowels and then consonant patterns. And that's how you begin to 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 chip away at breaking them. So again, in a short term, you know, immediate frontline thing, yes, it could, it could work, but if you continue using it on for on and on, there's simply too much stuff that's out now. I don't, I don't think it could work. Uh, what, what is the strength of the Cherokee and the Choctaw languages today? Um, how many people are speaking it? Is it being taught? Is it being expanded? There's a few thousand in both, in both Cherokee and Choctaw in Oklahoma. Um, I know that there are some Eastern Band speakers in North Carolina, but I don't have a, a statistic on that. Um, they are teaching. They have computer online courses. That's why I say literally anybody could, you know, study now. Um, but they are, they are strengthening. But, you know, people, uh, to be very frank, people tell me person to person in the communities that they're worried because there, it just isn't enough people catching it and really carrying it on. Uh, a lot of people study it, but sometimes you don't see that many that actually end up as fluent speakers. So it, it is a great concern. There's, there's four communities that I've worked in that I've seen the language go extinct in my lifetime, and I'm, I'm not that old yet, you know, so. So we, we are losing indigenous languages, but uh, Comanche, for example, it is, it is very, very small number of, of good speakers left, you know. Um, and I'm going to save these last two questions. We have time for two more. And they're on the same kind of uh, wavelength, which is about American Indian or pardon me, Native American um, people who are serving today. Hmm. So, for example, do you know, do you happen to know what percentage of various military branches have um, Native American service members in it currently? All um, of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, li literally all of them. Yeah. 
absolutely. And uh, I have a good plug for that in just a minute. So hold tight. Yeah. Um, and the, both of our guests are very interested in women, uh, Native Americans. Um, and if they serve in the military, they absolutely do. I'm going to jump in there. I know quite uh, many of them myself. They're lovely individuals. And in fact, if you come to the First Division Museum in our Duty First Gallery, in our four soldier story pods, we do have a soldier story interview with a uh, woman who is Native American. And she'll tell you about her service during Desert Storm. Absolutely. Um, you can always ask one of our volunteers. They'll show you how to get to it. And then the last question is, are there any tribal women who were ever recognized or participated, maybe not on the front, but in kind of the capacities of co-talking? Hmm. I do not know of any, um, you know, unless somebody did like some, some de facto, you know, de facto use of it in Desert Storm or, or Afghanistan, Iraq, I, I've never heard of any. Now, again, I'm open. I'm not saying it's impossible. Just haven't heard of any cases like that. Um, let's see, on, on, the, uh, on the women's subject, that's actually something I'm, I'm, I'm starting an ethnographic field school here in about uh, 15 days down in Oklahoma. And the last one and this one, we work specifically, it's veterans interviews. And so that's one of the thing is to increase my quantity of, of interviews with native women, because the numbers have really went up there, uh, particularly since say Desert Storm, uh, there's a, a huge number of native women in the, in the armed forces now. And again, all, all different branches and, and MOSs and things, um, but their story is almost invisible. You know, other than maybe a little news thing here and there, and that's one of the things that I'm I'm trying to focus on more is getting more of their experience, um, regardless of of uh, which branch or whatever. But you know, everything from enlistment and basic to how is how is um, you know um, health service now and things of that nature. You know, all the way through the post post war. Uh, but it's really I know some of it is economic. Uh, some of it is, you know, it is a good stepping stone, a lot of things, military service uh, for that and everything. Uh, a lot of it is family tradition still. I've had women tell me it's because, well, every cousin, every uncle, grandpa, everybody's a veteran. And so I, you know, I want to do that too. Um, so there are, I work in some societies also where they do honor uh, lady veterans pretty pretty well you know they bring them out and, and spot them spotlight them have them in their uniform and there's also several na uh, native women's veterans honor guards now that bring in the flags of powwows and things of that nature so yeah there there's a presence there um unfortunately at this point it's it's way under documented is what i would say Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to sneak in one more question and then uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. So I apologize for the shortness of our, of our time here. Um, but are various tribal languages similar? For instance, uh, could one tribe understand the code of, and language of another one during battle? Uh, yes and no. There are, you know, there's about 570 some groups. Um, there are, for example, in World War II, they pulled together seven Lakotas from different reservations of North, North and South Dakota, but they all spoke a dialect of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So they had accents for one another, but they could easily send messages. Now, in other cases, you can have two neighboring groups that do not have a single word in common. So it really just depends, it depends on which language family you're in, how big that language family, and then how many different groups. But it can be cases of both, you know. Uh, I know of one case where an officer used one tribe on Monday, another one on Tuesday, a third one on Wednesday, a fourth one on Thursday, and then he started the rotation over. He was using four different languages. Wow. So, so yeah, there are some, some groups that have nothing in common. There's others that um, it's just simply dialects. It's like us across the United States. We got some different things, but we can all understand each other. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all those answers. And thank you, everyone, for your guests. I told you they were A+. Plus. Um, really quickly, I do want to pass the mic over to one of our good friends here at the First Division Museum, which is the Trickster Art Gallery in Schaumburg. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about Native American veterans, uh, of course, you can join us here virtually on Zoom with the First Division Museum on Saturday, June 12th, to learn uh, more from Charles Norman Shea, who's going to be tuning in live with us from his home in France. He lives in 
the Normandy region of France currently, so you can tune in and hear more from him. Um, but also, if you'd like to, before tuning in to the Zoom with us and Charles live, the Trickster Art Gallery is going to be holding live at their gallery, which if you haven't been there yet, I highly suggest it. Um, their recent documentary, D-Day Warriors, it was Our War Two, which features Charles Shea. So you can watch the documentary on Saturday, June 5th, and then the next Saturday, come with us and uh, learn more from Charles um, in person here on Zoom. So I highly suggest it's an award-winning documentary. It's very good. You might have caught it on PBS recently, uh, but they're going to be showing it. I've been told there will be popcorn served, uh, but you can learn more and register for that event at tricksterculturalcenter.org. Um, and also I want to promote here with the Trickster Gallery, this event is here at Cantini Park, but it is done by the Trickster Art Gallery, which is the National Gathering of American Indian Veterans in July, and even though the name is the National Gathering of American Indian Veterans, all veterans are welcome. So feel free to, in July, if you want to learn more about it, you can stop here at the park and learn more. I want to thank everybody so much. The thank yous are coming in for you, Dr. Meadows. It seems like everybody really enjoyed the presentation this evening. Uh, last sort of uh, remarks is, yes, there will be a July date with history. It is on the book Low Level Hell by Hugh Mills. It will be about a pilot service in Vietnam with the 1st Infantry Division. You can sign up for that now at firstdivisionmuseum.org. Um, as always, everybody, if you have any questions or you want to know more about an event I talked about this evening, there were a lot tonight, feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to help you out. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Dr. Meadows, thank you again. And thank you, everybody. Night.